Good morning everyone. Today we're looking at the power struggle. We're focusing on how Stalin fought his way to the top. So when we think about it, if we say that backwardness, which was Russia, made a revolution easy, it also makes survival difficult. The challenge for the Bolsheviks, once they won the Civil War, was to develop a mechanism to continue socialism and to move that forward towards communism. So if we look at where we're placed in our syllabus, what we're focusing on today is the power struggle between Stalin, Trotsky and the other leading Bolsheviks. And people, I can't emphasise enough, you need to know more than Stalin and Trotsky. So remember that we have a number of leading figures. If we put them on a bit of a chart, over in the far left, we have Trotsky. Not quite as left was Zinoviev and Kamenev, who were some of the original me members of the vanguard. We have Stalin, who is moving between the left, right, and in the right we have Bukharin, who was supported by Rykov and Tomsky. So people, if you need to stop this video and take notes, feel free to pause it when you need to. Okay, let's move on. The big question when we look back at Stalin is how did the grey blur, this man with so little charisma, emerge as the final leader of the USSR, beloved of his people, the heir to Lenin. So when we look back, it began perhaps earlier than Lenin's death. Okay, Remember that Lenin's health really began to decline when he was shot. He had a series of strokes before his death, and that meant the power struggle began before his death in January 1924. So Stalin's positions before that time are worth knowing. In 1917, Stalin was made the Commissar for Nationalities. Now that gave him responsibility for almost half of the Russian population. Now the communist control of the regional areas and those nationalities was not particularly strong, but Stalin made a very real effort to encourage self-determination as long as those governments were socialist, as long as they agreed ultimately to enter to Moscow. So our next thing is that he built a support base in that role, and that's pointed out by our historian Stephen Kotkin. Please note carefully historians' views. You need to use them. Okay, in 1922, Stalin actually had a bit of a misstep. He was appointed as a commissar of the workers, and he didn't succeed in that role. So Stalin shifted positions, and he, when he shifted positions, he made a very important decision to appoint Stalin as a secretary general of the Communist Party. And people, that is the true basis of his power. So Commissar for Nationalities matters, and it was a stepping stone, but the one that really allowed him to succeed was being Secretary General of the Communist Party. That made him responsible for membership, positions, and purges. Now, Kotkin actually argues that the whole notion of a power struggle is exaggerated. Okay? When Lenin died, the odds were very much in favour of Stalin, and that that was because he was this General Secretary. And as General Secretary, he was admitting people to the party, and he could reward them for their support. He could also use his power to control membership to eliminate his opponents. He was in charge of the communications, the records, so he could see the flow of information. It is really important, if you wish to succeed, to think about and to know what your enemy is doing, and he could. Now, Stalin was really well aware of the importance of administration. And in a famous quote worth knowing, he said, I consider it completely unimportant who in the party will vote or how, but what is extraordinarily important is this, who will count the votes and how. And he was the person who was counting the votes. Okay, so let's move on to see how that plays out. So in our first round of Trotsky against Stalin, you need to know why Stalin actually attacked Trotsky. Firstly, Trotsky was the most obvious successor to Lenin. Okay? He was recognisable, he was popular, 
as commissar for war and learn that role. As commissar for war, Trotsky had led the Red Army brilliantly. His organisational skills were extremely high. But as Lenin identified in his last testament, Trotsky was also arrogant. He believed in internationalism, he believed in world revolution, and within Russia, he believed in permanent revolution. He wanted rapid change, especially moving towards industrialization. And this meant he strongly opposed the NEP. He denounced it as capitalists. These are very uncompromising views, and it alienated him from the moderates and the rioters led by Buchanan. Trotsky criticised the cause of Lenin. He didn't support the growing bureaucracy, which was an indirect criticism of Stalin, who ran that bureaucracy. And Trotsky believed in freedom of speech amongst the vanguard. So by expressing his views, he exposed himself to the accusation of factionalism. OK, so let's move on. How did Stalin attack Trotsky? Well, it was fairly simple. He formed an alliance. He formed it with Zinoviev, who was the chairman of the Comintern, and Kavanagh, who was the chairman of the Politburo. Both of them had opposed the October Revolution, and that really put a taint on their characters. Okay? It was unlikely that they were going to become the leaders of the party. And they both disliked Trotsky's prominence. So they agreed to help minimise the impact of Lenin's testament on Stalin. Zinoviev made sure that the testament was read only to the committee, not to the party as a whole. So the party as a whole did not hear Lenin's recommendation to dismiss Stalin. And Zinoviev, when he read it to the committee, actually spoke in Stalin's favour. He said that Lenin's concerns were basically exaggerated. So Lenin's testament had made Stalin a little vulnerable. Zinoviev and Kabinev helped him overcome that and allowed him to continue his attack on Trotsky. To become the most powerful man, you need to build up your own power base, and that's exactly what Stalin did. In 1923, he purged the party of radishes, red on the outside, white on the inside, in 1924, he began to swell the party, and he chose some new members, and these new members outnumbered the old Bolsheviks. Okay. So by 1925, the party was larger and far more pliable. It would do what Stalin recommended. Now, to really shore up his position, Stalin even wrote a book, and this was one of the moves that actually helped him to position himself as the heir to level. Lenin, okay, so he wrote the foundations of Leninism. Okay, moving to round two, the Politburo crisis. As Trotsky continued to criticise the NEP, he was gaining more. By 1925, by 1925, we have the situation that Trotsky is continuing to criticise the NEP, but now he's gaining more support. So many people are feeling it's far too capitalist, and those people include Zinoviev and Kamenev, who've moved back to support Trotsky. Now, faced with opposition from the left, Stalin aligned himself with the right and formed a very close relationship with Pekarin in particular. And with this power base, he was able to undermine the left. He was able to remove both Zinoviev and Kamenev from their Soviets, which had been their power base. In 1927, all three of them, Zinoviev, Kamenev and Trotsky, were denounced as traitors of the revolution and they were expelled from the party. So some of the allegations he made was that Trotsky was a Menshevitsk, he was a dangerous revolutionary, and he was an enemy of the people, a phrase that recurs throughout Stalin's reign. OK, let's look quickly at his relationship with the right, led by Buchanan. Lenin had said that Bukharin was a favourite of the whole party, but his theoretical views can be classified as fully Marxist only with great reserve. So basically, Lenin knew that Bukharin was veering towards capitalism, 
and his NEP does contain strongly capitalist elements, even though it retains control of the commanding heights of the economy. Okay, a fairly big thing is that Buchanan actually wanted the NEP to continue for 20 years. And that did impact on people's support. From 1925, support from the NEP diminished. Uh, it hadn't changed the economic basis of the USSR. It main, remained reliant on agriculture. The production had increased, but industry had not grown as rapidly. And Trotsky pointed out that there was a scissor crisis. The prices of manufactured goods was rising, the price of food is falling. And socially, kulaks and netmam, peasants and the intermediaries were enriching themselves. So the benefits are being retained by the individuals. It's not generating significant income for the government to fund infrastructure. Now, Stalin's big development from 1925 was to come up with a new ideology. And you must know his socialism in one country. Okay, he basically borrowed from others. He wanted to show himself as a committed revolutionary. So he wanted that element of strong control. He believed agriculture should be collectivized and that the state should take control of industrialization. But like Buchanan, borrowing from the right, he stressed the need to consolidate in the USSR before you could do anything else, before there could be world revolution. And this ideology of socialism in one country was simple and appealed to So at this point, Stalin attacks the right. So remember that in 1925, Stalin had allied himself with Bukharin and the right and supported the NEP. In 1927, two years later, he denounced the NEP. He was now offering an alternative path and he claimed it was better. The policy actually started to be implemented in 1927, but he persuaded the Politburo to completely support it in 1928, and that's when they implemented the five-year plans. So the must-know of it is that the right wanted the NEP to continue and that Stalin withdrew his support and successfully attacked the right. Okay. So when we look at his five-year plan very quickly, his main agenda was to say that basically the USSR was under threat. Okay. It had to industrialise rapidly. If it did not do so, then it was in danger of being attacked and crushed by the capitalist nations. So the must know that we'll finish off on next time is that the command economy involves strong centralised state with a capital S control. It's got explicit targets for increased productivity. Okay. And as a starting point for that, the agriculture is controlled. Under Article 107 of the Criminal Code, concealing grain becomes a crime. And soldiers are sent into the country to collect the grain. The peasants are forced to collectivise, to move on to the large colcots, the collective farms. So the must-know summary of why Stalin won and by 1928, he had clearly won. He was a tireless worker. His skills in politics and his skills in administration were highly relevant at that point in time. He used his position as general secretary to promote his own supporters, to control the votes. He was ruthless in his treatment of opponents. He did not leave them in the Soviet Union. They were expelled from the party. They were expelled from the place. Quite a few of them were later killed in the Great Terror. Stalin manipulated events to create a sense of urgency and to force decisions. Okay. That allegation that either we industrialise or we will be crushed is a classic example of that. And Stalin manipulated ideologies. He manipulated his position as the heir to Lenin. He manipulated the economic concerns. And he was able to outmaneuver both the left with Trotsky and the right with Buchanan. And Stalin won not just because of his own strengths, he also won because his opponents consistently underestimated their great work. And people 
that's it for today. In the words of a Tony, we're done. <laughs>